Good Saturday morning. I'm Nadia Vilchik and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by my brother, Dr. Anton Vilchik. Anton Vilchik is a cancer surgeon. He is a scientific researcher in the area of cancer. And what a moment to be talking today. Dr. Anton Vilchik, welcome. Thank so you. we're talking about this diagnosis that Princess Kate gets. So help us unpack exactly what you are hearing and understanding. So all so, we know at um, this point is that um, she had, she has a, uh, had an abdominal cancer that was surgically removed and she's now on chemotherapy. Now, the abdomen um, is, um, you know, a structure in the body that includes multiple organs. Um, what we are seeing in, um, in certainly in, in, in my area, is a large increase in what we call early onset cancer. So, the, the incidence of uh, cancer in young people under age 50 has gone up as high as 70%. I mean, these numbers are astounding. The cancer that seems to be um, increasing more than any other cancer is, is colon cancer. Uh, colon cancer uh, now in um, males under age 50 is the leading cause of cancer-related deaths and in women is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths and is thought to, be, to become the leading cause by the year 2030. Now, we still don't know what uh, the princess uh, was diagnosed with. Uh, there was some level of suspicion that the surgery was major since she was in the, in the hospital for almost two weeks, and that's, that's a fairly long period of time. Um, it, you know, the, the, we just, I think, um, you know, everyone thinks of the abdomen as being a single, a single cancer. And, I, I, you know, until we get more uh, information, um, you know, each organ is different. Um, you know, when we hear words like preventative chemotherapy, it's, it's not really a scientific term, preventative chemotherapy. We'll sometimes say that to patients um, to suggest that the cancer is out of their body, that they're cancer free, but we're going to give you some chemotherapy as a form of prevention to reduce the chance of it coming back. Now, th th that in itself is, is, is very reassuring to patients, but usually chemotherapy is given if there is a chance of cancer coming back. And chemotherapy is given to reduce the chance of, 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 of cancer coming back. But again, you know, we have to be very sensitive to the fact that we just don't have uh, specific uh, information as to what the cancer is. So I'm just curious, here we have Princess Kate, what do you think made her go to the doctor? Was she experiencing in your experience? And again, very clear here, we're speculating with limited information, but would she have had severe stomach cramps? What, what would she be experiencing? What do people who are watching this need to know if they are feeling this, they need to go and see a gastroenterologist? Well, that's what's um, very intriguing about uh, Princess Kate, because she's not only 42 years old, but she appears to be very healthy. Um, she exercises She's not overweight. Um, she's not a not a smoker. Um, she's not obese. She's not diabetic. You know, there there, there are risk factors. Um, she doesn't have a um, a family history that we know of um, of um, abdominal cancers. Um, so when you when you have risk factors, you certainly have to be more aware. Now, symptoms could be extremely vague. Symptoms could be w uh, unexpected weight loss, um, uh, abdominal or stomach cramping or bloating. Um, loss of uh, anemia is a, is a common symptom, just getting a blood test and um, uh, having an, uh, an unexpected low uh, blood count or he a hemoglobin. Um, 
And uh, then there are um, more, you know, specific symptoms such as uh, rectal bleeding um, or throwing up blood. Um, th those, you know, certainly are um, red flags. Um, there, and, and so one, one has to be, you know, sensitive to the fact that symptoms can be very mild or they can be more obvious. Most, most early cancers are detected through screening. Now, I know this is an area, Anton, that you have been doing an enormous amount of research around early cancer screening. So tell us more about just the importance of doing that. And for anyone who's joining us, how critical this is. Well, I, I, I think it's critical. I mean, I, you know, I have a special interest in early onset uh, colorectal cancer um, because we are seeing now um, something that we have never seen before. Um, and which is, you know, that, that every single week I'm seeing someone under age 45 with colon cancer. And colon cancer used to be a, a disease that was seen more commonly in people over age 65. Um, now it's actually decreased in people over age 65, but it, it's, it's increasing um, at a rate that um, is, is extremely concerning, so much so that the screening guidelines for, for colon cancer uh, were reduced by the U.S. Preventative Task Force in March of 21 um, from age 50 to age 45. Now that says a lot when... Um, you know, government agencies are actually reducing screening age. That tells you that the previous screening age was just too old. Now, some would argue that the screening age should actually be even, you know, less than age than age 45. And the question really is why? Um, you know, there are definite links. In fact, there are studies out this week um, showing an even, you know, closer link to processed food, red meat, um, la a sedentary lifestyle, um, lack of exercise or no exercise to, col you know, to colon cancer. So, so these are some, some known, um, you know, some known factors. There are also some incredibly fascinating areas of research that are going on right now. I mean, we have 2 trillion bacteria within our body known as the microbiome. And, the, and these bacteria are extremely important in terms of keeping balance. They're important in the immune system. Um, if the bacteria are disrupted in any way, that can lead or predispose people to heart disease or, or cancer. And so there's some thought that um, disrupting this bacterial balance, even at a young age, may predispose people to cancer down the road. I mean, these these are huge areas of of research uh, right now in trying to to better understand um, this this incredible increase in young people being diagnosed with uh, with cancer. Can I just say to whoever is joining us right now, I am speaking to a renowned cancer surgeon, researcher, my brother, Dr. Anton Bilchik. Anton comes to us from Los Angeles. We are talking about cancer, early diagnosis of cancer. And Anton is giving us some ways of understanding why there is an increase in cancer amongst younger people, and in fact, an increase in cancer in general. Anton, I want to go back to Princess Kate for a moment. So here she is, she's a young woman. Some people might say she's too thin. You said she's not overweight, but you say being too thin isn't necessarily a risk factor. Being overweight is, because there's been a lot of speculation when one reads the newspaper, well, is she too thin? Was she nourished enough? And I've been reading those kind of comments. So want to ask you about that. Yeah, being, being too thin is often a consequence uh, of of cancer rather than a cause. Mm. Um, obesity is a definite um, cause of of cancer. Um, obesity, you know, one of the big uh, another area that is really important right now in in understanding 
causes of, of, of cancer is the term inflammation. Right. And so help us unpack inflammation and again, how we know we're experiencing it and how we can combat it. Well, we, we know that, um, that inflammation uh, can lead again to a higher risk of, of cancer and to a higher risk of, um, of, of cardiovascular disease. And you have to think in terms of what causes inflammation, so what is pro-inflammation, and what is anti-inflammation. So um, if you eat the wrong foods, that's pro-inflammation, right? Processed food, uh, red meat, uh, uh, too much alcohol, smoking, that's pro-inflammation. Exercise, um, eating a, a balanced diet is anti-inflammatory. Now, there, there are some blood tests that can look at inflammation. There's a blood test called C-reactive protein, which is... I have to say that slowly and spell it so that anybody who's watching who wants to have their inflammation levels checked out can look at that. C-reactive, R-E-A-C-T-I-V-E protein, P-R-O-T-E-I-N. So Thank that you. is a... Um, that is a blood test. It's not a, we don't have um, a blood test that tells you that you 100% have inflammation and, and therefore you are at risk for getting, um, you know, such a cancer. I can tell you that there um, are several um, research groups that are, um, you know, exploring blood tests to predict cancer down the road. And this has become a, I mean, a, you know, a, a few years from now, I think when, when we uh, use artificial intelligence and we use, you know, some of the tools that are now um, being, you know, heavily researched, um, I, I think we're going to be living in a very different world where, um, you know, instead of, you um, being diagnosed with cancer at a certain age, we may have a blood test that'll, that'll tell us you are at risk for getting this cancer and therefore you may want to do the following. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's so much going on in this space right now that we are about to see an explosion of information in the next few years to you know, to really give us some insight as to what our lives are likely to be a few years, you know, um, five, 10 years later. So I am getting a couple of questions in and I wanted to ask you this one. So a question is, so do you have any idea of the kind of surgery that Princess Kate had? What was the initial surgery? What were they looking for? Um, so obviously um, we have absolutely no, no idea and I think it would be very irresponsible to, to speculate. Um, what, what I can say as a cancer surgeon who operates in the abdomen every single week um, is that you generally, when you remove um, a tumor or a mass or a growth um, from the abdomen, you generally have a an idea whether it is cancerous or not. How? And, there, and there are ways, uh, firstly, it has um, a specific uh, appearance, um, you know, cancerous or cancerous tumors um, are, you know, they, they tend to be firm, they tend to, you know, have kind of an irregular shape. Um, they, you know, th th there are many different ways of, of, of looking at the abdomen and, and, and uh, most experienced surgeons will say, you know, this, is, this really is highly suspicious for a cancer. Also, um, and, and I think this is the other, you know, area that, um, that uh, you know, really leaves a lot, of, a lot of questions is in the operating room, if we um, suspect a, a cancer will get what's called a frozen section. So we'll take a piece of the growth and we'll send it to the pathologist while the patient is asleep and they can look at it at a, you know, under a microscope. 
Um, and, you know, then it, it can perhaps even guide the surgery. It's also important in terms of telling us, are our margins clean? If it is a cancer, do we need to take more? Because we don't want to have what are called close margins. In other words, leave tissue that's close to the cancer. And I have to, and again, this is speculation, I have to suspect that they knew a lot more at the time of surgery or very soon after the surgery. Um, you know, when, and as I recall, um, you know, it was reported that there was no cancer, everything was benign. And then the narrative changed and, and it may have changed for various reasons. But all I can say is that, you know, as a, as a cancer surgeon, you generally have an idea at the time of surgery and there are tools that we have that we, you know, regularly use if we are not entirely sure. And the prognosis for wellness. So one of the things that Princess Kate said, and I'll show you the picture of her over here. There she is in that corner sitting on the bench talking to all of us about, you know, I am having preventative chemotherapy and I thought it was a very measured, very well written address, right? You say there isn't such thing really as preventative chemo, that the chemo is there to ensure there's no further spread. What is that chemo going to look like day to day? And just again, for a woman who's young and healthy, what are the chances? And again, if anything is uncomfortable, you can't answer, please don't. Well, I think so, so again, I think it's, it's really about the, the terminology. I'm, I'm not suggesting that she has any sign of cancer spread or that, uh, you know, in the, in the abdomen, and again, I think this is very important for your viewers to know, is that um, a colon cancer is completely different to a pancreas cancer, which is completely different to a stomach cancer, which is completely different to a liver cancer or a gallbladder cancer um, or an esophagus cancer or a ovarian cancer. They, you know, um, each cancer is different and you can have a, um, a cancer, for example, of the pancreas, um, which doesn't have sign of, of, of spread, um, but the cancer cells themselves and the organ being the pancreas can be a very aggressive cancer, even, even if it is something that is completely removed. And so, so um, you know, most oncologists are likely to treat um, pancreas cancer, for example, with surgery and chemotherapy or chemotherapy first, then surgery. Colon cancer um, can, can go to lymph nodes um, and can then go elsewhere. Now, colon cancer, if it, if it spreads to lymph nodes, is potentially, it, most times it's just curable, even if it's gone to lymph nodes. But if it's gone to lymph nodes, then there is a chance that there may be rogue cells floating around um, that you just can't see or detect. And chemotherapy is, is given. Uh, so, you know, to, to reduce the chance of those rogue cells settling somewhere. Now, I'm getting another question in here. Somebody's asking, how do we know this was colon versus, let's say, ovarian cancer? Oh, and, and I think that I'm glad someone asked that because, the, you know, this gets back to the word abdomen. Um, you know, it could be anything. I, I, I have to believe... Um, you know, that the when they refer to the abdomen, they're referring to the intestinal tract, either the stomach, the pancreas, the colon. And, and, and I think the reason, um, and again, this is speculation, people are suspicious of colon cancer simply because when we look at um, statistics right now, um, we're, seeing the, we're seeing this rapid increase in colon cancer more so than any other abdominal cancer among young people. Um, that's all we know. But could, could they be referring to a gynecologic cancer as an abdominal cancer? It's possible. Um, the uterus that's and possible. the ovaries are within the abdomen. So the word right. abdomen is extremely, extremely vague. And, you know, 
our podcast, yours and mine, the concept of live long, live strong, live healthy. And I'm so excited because this really is our first episode of live long, live strong, live healthy, is to just look at ways that you with your expertise and wisdom can help people understand how important early detection is. I wanted to talk about another very well-known person. And I recently saw the movie about um Bob Marley, and uh, it's called One Love, and Bob Marley also died of cancer. And according to the film, and according to what you read, it is a cancer that may have been prevented. Can you shed light on that a little? Sure. So, you know, just to um, um, unwrap, you know, your 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 question, because I think there's several several you know parts to that. Um, you know, up to 70% of cancers, is, you know, and, and I'm mostly referring to, to colorectal cancer, is preventable. So that, you, you know, and that's why, you know, I think one has to be, um, and this is just my personal belief, that the clock starts, starts ticking at a young age. So when one thinks of, of cancer prevention, you've got cancer prevention and then you've got screening. You mentioned the word screening, which, which, is, is, a, which is extremely know. important. But we also have to think in terms of cancer prevention. What can you know your viewers do or, or how can they um, advise their families? And this is where I think, again, at a young age, whether it be at you know, preschool, um, you know, avoiding vending machines, trying to stay away from processed food, exercising, um, doing all the things that we know are important um, should be done at a at, at, at a young age, um, and 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 now to you know to switch to the to the Bob Marley situation. Um, so he he died as um, you know as best as I know of melanoma, right. which is oh, yeah, which, that's which is an aggressive an aggressive skin cancer. Now um, melanoma you know, is largely caused by exposure to the sun. So this, again, gets back to prevention. Um, you know, when, when we were growing up, we weren't, um, you know, that aware of applying sunscreen regularly or staying out of the sun or the dangers of the sun. Um, I, I, I recall vividly us going on vacation and getting horribly burnt and peeling. Um, well, every time you do that, you are predisposing yourself to skin cancer. And there are three different kinds of skin cancers that are caused by the sun. There's basal cell cancer, there's squamous cell cancer, and there's melanoma. Now, the first two, very, very common, tend to be very local. Melanoma, which is what Bob Marley died from, um, you know, is a far more aggressive cancer. It can spread all over the body, and it also can be found in the strangest places. In his case, um, I mean, it's, it's more common in, in Caucasians than Blacks, although it can occur in Blacks. And often when it's diagnosed in Blacks, it's going to be more advanced because um, it's, it's, it's more difficult to, to detect. His, his melanoma, as I understand it, um, originated from under his toenail. That's right. And then the, the controversy was, should he have his toe amputated and he chose not to correct and you know melanoma i um trained at the one of the melanoma capitals in in the world really and and, and the t a lot of the techniques for melanoma started my institution the john wayne cancer institute um uh which was um started by dr donald morton and Don dr donald morton my mentor um certainly um uh, was one of the, the pioneers of um, diagnosis of melanoma and of melanoma treatment. Um, so this is, you know, this is something that I spent a lot of, lot of time both as a trainee and then as a faculty member um, dealing with what, you know, the, um, the most Im imp important treatment, most effective treatment for, for melanoma is to, is to remove it. Now, um, you know, if you have a melanoma that's under a toenail, 
um, that's usually an aggressive melanoma. Now, the technique that um, was started at, you know, at our institution was called the sentinel node procedure. And that's a way of evaluating um, whether that melanoma has spread anywhere else, specifically to a lymph node. So it's a very simple, you know, um, technique. Um, now, if, uh, you know, someone is diagnosed with a, what's called a subannual um, melanoma, which is a melanoma under the toenail, yes, amputation is um, likely to be the, you know, the most effective uh, treatment. Now, unfortunately, um, you know, when, when Bob Marley was diagnosed with melanoma, a lot of the treatments um, that are now available were not available then. Um, up to 50% of people with even advanced melanoma can now be cured with, with immunotherapy. Um, and there's, you know, so the whole field of, of melanoma has, has changed. Um, I, I think a, another good example of melanoma is President Carter. I think when he, he, when he was diagnosed, um, as I recall, he was diagnosed with advanced melanoma and no one thought that he was going to live very long because the, the survival with advanced melanoma, we're talking about stage four melanoma, used to be um, very low. But now with these, these, these modern um, immunotherapy drugs, um, the chances of uh, keeping people alive a long time have gone up um, enormously. So there'll be massive improve, improvements in the treatment of, of melanoma. But to get back to your original question, exposure to the sun. It's as simple as that, exposure to the sun. So as a child, you, you know, your skin starts changing at a, at a very early age. So um, no one should spend time in the sun without sunscreen um, or uncovered. No one should burn and peel. And, you know, parents need to be very aware um, of their kids being exposed to the sun because the sun is what's known as a carcinogen. So that's a, um, a carcinogen is something that causes cancer. It's very rare to find someone with skin cancer who has not spent time in the sun. You, in the half hour we've spent together, have covered so much ground and really given so much insight we started off our discussion today, Antoine, talking about Princess Kate. And of course, it has worldwide interest and attention, which in a way, sad and difficult as it is, is probably a positive thing because it might make other people get screened. So from your point of view, let's just unpack and just give a summary, talking about Princess Kate, of what we've seen what she might be going through, and what each and every one of us can learn from this. So I think the, the first thing is um, we need to be very sensitive to what she and her family are going through. Um, it, it's, it, you know, every, every day I, I see a young person be diagno diagnosed with cancer, um, it leaves people torn. There's, there's, there's so much that's just unknown. Um, you know, what's my treatment going to be? How am I going to, you know, what are the consequences of surgery? What are the consequences of chemotherapy? What am I going to tell my kids? What is my family going to think? You know, you watch your life just go by you in, the, in this very, you know, surreal, surreal way. And so I think one has to be very sensitive to, um, you know, giving her and her family space and not, not just her and her family, but any, any young person being diagnosed with, with cancer. I think uh, something else that is, ex you know, just extremely important is that the first thing people do when they get a diagnosis of cancer is they Google and they become their own doctors. And, you know, there have been studies shown that up to 70% of what people research about their own health is not, is not entirely accurate. Hmm. And, you know, we live in this world of 
of transparency where patients are often getting their results before the doctors even have a chance to get them or interpret them. We all have these apps. And so you get an x-ray and the report, the moment there's a report, it goes to your app and people are on their apps and they see words and immediately they start looking up those words and it sends um, patients and families into a tailspin. So, so I think, you know, they're, they're, you know, Googling is helpful, but it is extremely important to let your doctors or your healthcare providers, you know, make help help interpret things for you. Um, I I also, you know, what's what um, the situation with Princess um, Kate? I, I I think there is no question that it is going to save many other lives because anyone that is um, kind of second guessing whether they should get a screening mammogram, for example, or a, um, a screening colon colonoscopy, and it doesn't even have to be a colonoscopy. There are now home stool tests that are very sensitive for picking up colon cancer. So, that, so I think that um, th there is definitely going to be a lot more people sensitive to getting screened rather than just talking about it and hearing about it because she is the last person, you know, just looking at it that, that you would think of being diagnosed with an abdominal cancer. So if it can happen to her, it can happen to any one of us. And that's the reason why I think, um, the, you know, cancer is preventable um, through some of the factors we've discussed but also most cancers are cured, especially if detected early. And how do you detect them early? It's through screening. And we have very effective ways of screening. Dr. Anton Vilcek, who is a cancer surgeon, a researcher in the area of cancer, early detection. I am so delighted, Anton, that you and I are going to be doing a podcast on Live Strong, Live Long, Live Healthy, because so many of these things, inflammatory, what's anti-inflammatory, and allowing us to know how to really take care of our health is so important. So thank you so much. I look forward to our next conversation, and our next conversation Let's hope it's going to be um, a positive outcome. How long, when she says this uh, chemotherapy, how long is it going to be? And somebody's asking me the question, oh, will she lose her hair is one of the questions we are getting. So, yeah, so, so two, two great questions. Um, chemotherapy can be given, is, is typically given for six months, but in some cases is given for three months. It's given for sh you know, a shorter period of time. There are some chemotherapy drugs where you lose your hair. So some of the stronger chemotherapy drugs, for, for example, for um, breast cancer, it's very common for or ovarian cancer, it's common for women to lose their hair. For colon cancer, the standard chemotherapy that's, that's used, um, a drug called oxaliplatin, tends to lead to numbness, but, but not hair loss. So... Um, it, it'll actually, I mean, you know, it, it, it sounds like um, she's, you know, not going to be in the public eye for, for several months, but, um, you know, losing your hair uh, certainly comes from certain drugs that are used for certain abdominal cancers. <laughs> so, okay. if she doesn't, so if she doesn't lose her hair, um, it will raise a level of suspicion as to what the cancer might be, if that makes any sense. Yes, that makes sense. So we will continue the conversation. I just wanted to read you some of the immediate feedback we're getting. Um, amazing brother, um, amazing podcast with such insight, excellent information and great information. So I think, again, you really are providing great information. And, and Anton, thank you so much. I know this is your precious Saturday morning, but felt it was very pertinent because it's something, and, and I think you just said it there, if it can happen to her, it can happen to any one of us. We have so much to discuss in the next few months and weeks about health and wellness, mental health, physical health, and 
we haven't got to what a part stress may pay, play in all of this. So can we keep that for the next conversation? Yes. Because stress, you. you've told me before, is inflammatory. So my brother, Dr. Anton Vilcek, thank you very much. And um, again, cancer surgeon, researcher, remarkable human being, and really wants to share your advice and guidance on health. So I hope you have a lovely, healthy rest of the day. Do you have some exercise planned? Absolutely. I'm going to go around, see my patients, and then I'm on the treadmill. And then, as we always say at the end of our podcast, hi, mom. Hi, <laughs> Bye. mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this information. Excellent and appreciate it. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Nadia. You, you have a wonderful